Good morning, Cornerstone. Let's stand to our feet as we celebrate the victory that we find in Jesus. Father God, we just gather here to meet with you. Come and have your way in this place. Reviver, Father, friend, you made our hearts to be.
gathering place. You know, this is a great church and you guys are gonna be so blessed. So if you are new to Cornerstone here, please text hello to 405-266-2242. Again, that's 405-266-2242. Anyway, also, if you will check in on Facebook, and let the whole world know that you're here. But every check, every 10 check-ins in face on Facebook that says that you're here at Cornerstone, we partnered with a ministry and we give a pair of shoes to children in need. And you know, in between services, I counted just the people I'm connected to. And so we gave, we were able to give away over three pairs of shoes so far this morning. Isn't that awesome? So go ahead and check in. All right, so you guys continue to worship with us. Allow the chaos of last week to just pass and just get in his presence. Lord, we come to meet with you in this place.
Lord, we thank you, Jesus. Lord God, you did not leave us here. Lord God, you came. You lived, you died. But that that's not the end of the story, God, that you conquered death to give us the victory, God. That through you we can find victory, God. Through you we can find freedom. And Father, we just give you that praise this morning and just invite you to come and have your way in this place. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Thanks so much for worshiping with us. Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be back. I, uh, I want to say thanks to my wife. I started to say who filled in for me, but I think it was more like she took over. I've got to watch my back. But it is good to be back, and uh, I was gone away. I was on the mountaintop. That sounded much more spiritual than it was. I was riding a mountain bike down the mountaintop, but I thought I'd try to get away with making you think I was real spiritual. But we had a great time, uh, but it is always good to be back home and to be able to get connected with you again today. It's good to see our youth over here. They're in the middle of their discipleship program. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> and... Uh, Part of their discipleship is getting ready to go to missions trips, so they're just building some cohesion, and they're with their leaders together, and so we love them, but do not make me come over there. That's all I've got to say, especially the little blonde right there. That one's mine. Yeah. Now, you don't know her, but she's mean. She really is. I love her, but she is mean. Um, I want to begin where we started a couple of weeks ago on a series entitled Tell the Story. And, of course, I'm talking about telling his story, which is the greatest story ever told. And we've had some breaks in this series just because of special services and other things going on. But if you remember, I started the series with these four chairs. And I want to go back, not just to review these chairs, but I want to kind of approach it in a new way today. But primarily, when we come to church, we sit in one of these chairs, one of these three chairs. There are those that when they come to church, they sit in what I call the worship chair because they're all about that worship. They love the worship music. They love entering into service, and that's the main draw for them is just to be able to worship God. But then there are those that come, and they sit in what I call the discipleship chair. Worship's okay. They don't object to worship, but they're kind of a more of a, of a nuts and bolts type of personality that says, Give me a word that will fix my situation. Show me a principle from the Word of God. Give me something that I can apply to my life, something that is applicable to get me through what I'm going through. And then there is the chair that we call the community chair because there are those that come to church because this is where all of your relationships are. This is your family, your friends, the people you hang out with, the people you do life together. And I know that we may come on certain days and different times and may sit in a different chair according to the need, but primarily, we're wired worshipers, discipleship, or community. And it doesn't mean that you don't enjoy the others. It it may be a 60-40, it may be a 70-30 mix, but primarily, you're wired that way. But what happens is we often overlook the fourth chair, which is others, Maybe it's because it's been so long since we've sat in that chair, since we were a new person, or we've kind of just focused on what's going on in our lives. But I want to explore this chair a little bit more. I want to get this chair into our thinking, or maybe more accurately, I want to get the word others into our thinking. I want it to become more and more of our culture of who we are. In fact, our mission statement of our church, and I love our mission statement, which is taking Jesus to others. And let me just take a moment and break that down because here's what it means, taking. That means we're not just waiting for people to show up. You know, we don't have the attitude, we're the church, you know where we are when you get ready. We want to take Jesus to others. We want to take Jesus outside the walls of our church into the life of others, or we want to do types of events that, will, that are focused on others that will cause them to come in and draw into this place. Taking Jesus, because it's his story we're telling, the greatest story ever told, the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we want people to hear that story. Taking Jesus to others, and others may be other believers. 
It may be family members. It may be the lost, the unsaved. It may be the stranger. It's just whoever that God presents in our life that they have a need, we take Jesus to that need. If they're hurting, we comfort them. If they're hungry, we feed them. If, if they're broken, we, we minister to them. If, we're, if they're sick, we lay hands on them. If they need encouragement, we encourage them with words of Jesus. Taking Jesus to others is who we are, whether it's in our world or literally around the world. But we could also say the message of the, of the three chairs this way. It's just kind of another way of thinking about it. It's because everything that we do at Cornerstone flows under one of these categories that we are reaching up. That would be the worship chair. Because when people come to our church, we want them to have a vertical experience. We want them to encounter God or have more of a God encounter than they do a man encounter. Why? Because man cannot change your life. Only God can change a life. And we want people to experience these God moments, whether it's through worship or preaching or, or some type of ministry, that they encounter the presence of God. So we're always reaching up. But not only are we reaching up, we're reaching in, and that's discipleship. See, we want to touch the heart of people through preaching. Preaching is not just flowing information. Preaching is about transformation. And my goal as a pastor is that when people come to this church is that they begin to grow. I want people to be able to look back at their lives and say, over the last year, I have grown so much because of the Word of God that's changing me. And then we have the reaching across, across the aisle to the people around me, reaching across, bridging the gap, realizing that this is a community that we're doing life together. And then finally, we would have the reaching out, going outside the walls of our church, going outside of our comfort zone, reaching out beyond what we're used to so that we can have different people come into our church and new faces and new life. So reaching up, reaching in, reaching across, and reaching out. Here's a question. What happens to church when we do church for others? What happens when we worship with others in mind? It's a good question, isn't it? What happens when we hear a message and we hear a sermon, and all the time we're hearing that sermon and it's changing us, we're thinking about others? Or what happens when we come to church, to this community, with others in mind? I can tell you one thing that happens. One thing that happens when we worship or we hear or we fellowship with others in mind is that it, it causes us to lose this consumer mentality that so often in so many churches we have. The church ought to be just there for me. It ought to exist for me and my family and my needs and what I'm going through. And I want it to be something that I like. And I get that. I understand that. But church is where we worship and serve. That's it. That's the purpose of the church. It's where we worship and we serve. It's where we get our eyes off of ourselves, off of our needs, off of our wants, off of me. And I begin to say, God, use me. So we begin to focus on the purpose of church, which is others. Now, I want, you, I want you to watch what happens. When I take the worship chair and I put it next to the others chair, what happens to church? How does it change the dynamic of church when I begin to worship with others in mind? First of all, let me say this. Worshiping together with others may be the single most important thing we do as a church. See, one of the things it does is it rekindles our spiritual fire. When I begin to enter into a worship service with other people, it rekindles the fire that is within me. The Bible says iron sharpens iron. And it gives me the assurance that I'm not alone. How many of you remember the story of, of Elijah when he had that major meltdown in the presence of God? And he said, God, just kill me. I'm the only one out here doing anything. I'm the only one serving you. Just kill me. 
And God had to give him a reality check. And he said, Elijah, there are 7,000 other prophets that are doing what you do that love me the way you love me. Sometimes we forget that there are a lot of people that love God the way we love God. And a corporate worship service reminds us that we're not alone and it energizes us. Did you realize this? That public worship, a corporate worship service is the closest thing to heaven you will ever find on planet earth. Almost every time you read in the Bible and you read a description of heaven, that description of heaven includes people standing together worshiping before the throne. A worship service is heaven on earth. So we need to realize how powerful it is. But not only that, public worship is also evangelism. How how so, Pastor? What do you mean? Well, let me give you a scripture from the book of 1 Corinthians In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and beginning in in verse 23, here's what Paul says. He says, so then if the whole church gathers together and all of you speak in unknown tongues and outsiders or those who are not gifted in spiritual matters or unbelievers come in, will they not say that you're out of your mind? But if all prophesy... Speak a new message from God to the people. If all speak and preach words of encouragement and an unbeliever or an outsider comes in, he is convicted by all. He is called to account by all because he can understand what is being said. The secrets of his heart are laid bare. And so falling on his face, he will worship God, declaring that God is really among you. So Paul is showing in that verse of Scripture that our worship doesn't only affect us, it affects those around us. That whenever we worship, we should keep others in mind. Others who are seeking to know God, others who are searching for answers, others who are looking for more. Keep them at the heart of what we're doing. Morgan Freeman The actor, Shawshank Redemption, right? Great movie. Morgan Freeman has a documentary series coming out called The Story of God. And in one episode called Heaven and Hell, he explores an experience that he had in a worship service at a Pentecostal church. And here's what he said. He said, all around me, people have been caught up by an invisible force. And now they speak what they believe is the language of heaven. I see it on their faces, and they are genuinely somewhere else. He went on to say that it's a, it was quite a powerful experience, and I could feel the energy in that space. It impacted him. It influenced him. It drew him in. It was a sign and a wonder that caused him to look deeper into the things of God. Now, whether it's a full-blown Pentecostal church or whether it's a Baptist church or or somewhere in in between like a cornerstone church, it's our worship that draws people into the presence of a loving God. So worship is evangelism. Here's what Jesus said. Jesus said in John 12, verse 23, he said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And that's what a worship service does is it puts Jesus on the throne. It exalts him. And when we do that, people are drawn to look to him. Worship is evangelism. More people, everyone say more people. More people, more people are won to Christ by experiencing God's presence than they are by theological arguments. More people come to Christ by God's presence than someone trying to break it down and theologically debate and argue with someone else. In fact, the Bible says don't do that. Don't argue the Bible. Don't get into theological debates. Don't go with these vain disputings. Just do what you know to do and love God and serve God and let a changed life tell his story. William Booth, who's the founder of the Salvation Army, I love this statement. He said, if a church is on fire, people will come from miles around in every direction just to watch it burn. Isn't that truth? So think of it like this, when seekers come through our doors, when visitors come through our doors, when guests attend our church, they may not understand everything that happens in a worship service, 
but they know joy when they see it. They recognize a changed life when they see it. They understand when hope comes alive in their heart and they have an idea that maybe my life can be better and more peaceful and more joy and my family can not be quite so dysfunctional. And if they realize that from a worship service, guess what? They know the opposite is true as well. If they come into a church where worship is dead and dry and people are going through the motions and worship is on autopilot, then their thought is, why bother? Why try? Our worship is evangelism. And when we worship with others in mind, it causes us to be more passionate because someone sitting next to me or around me may need to know God. And through my powerful and personal and intimate worship, maybe it'll create an atmosphere where they'll know God. Jesus said to a group of Pharisees one day that they weren't happy the way his disciples were worshiping him. And Jesus said, here's the deal. If they remain silent, the very stones will cry out. Okay, so next, what happens, what happens when I take the discipleship chair? That's okay, guys. I got it. I'll do all the work. Just sit there. <laughs> what happens when we take the discipleship chair and we set the discipleship chair next to the other's chair. Again, it changes the dynamic of our service. It changes the dynamic of what we're doing. See, I've often said that if any time you sit in church and you hear a message that's not for you, and I'll just go ahead and put a disclaimer to that, very seldom will that happen. Very seldom will there be a message preached on any subject that the Holy Spirit will not take and apply something to your heart. But if you're ever sitting in a service and you hear a message and you're thinking, this does not apply to me at all, then if it's not for you, it's for you to give to someone. If it's not for you, it's for you to take outside the walls of the church and find someone that that fits in their life and help them with their struggle. So when I sit in the discipleship chair and I move it next to the other's chair, I realize that now then whatever God flows to me, he wants to flow through me. That I am his mouthpiece. And so when I hear a message, I'm focused on others. I'm thinking about who could use this? Who could this help? Who could I encourage? Who could I share what I've heard? Because it doesn't stop with me. It just flows through me. And this is how you pastor the people you work with. This is how you pastor the people in your neighborhood and in your family. When you hear something and you think, okay, I've got to take this and I've got to pass it on to someone else. I've got to give this to another person. When I'm others mind, when I'm others minded, I hear the word. It causes me to focus my words, my thoughts, my prayers, my heart on another person. And it doesn't stop with me. I pray for them. I love on them. I intercede for them. And so let me, let me just give you a very practical principle to get started. Because sometimes it overwhelms us to think, well, who can I go to and share this with? Let me give you a great place to get started, to hear a message that you hear today. Take it to your family. I don't know, but if your family's like my family, they need all the preaching they can get. Amen. Especially that one. They need all the word they can get. And so why don't we begin by just ministering to our own family? Why don't we just take something that we hear and at the table tonight or in the car this afternoon or somewhere that we are, just share the word with them. Or maybe it's our, maybe it's not our immediate family, but outside of our, these are people that we know that we love. If they get mad at us, we don't care. (laughs) They've been mad at us before. They'll get over it. And we just begin to go to them and meet needs in their lives and love on our own family. And it begins to build your confidence. And one day you'll step outside the walls of your family and you'll begin to share with people that you work with or people that are around you or people that God has put in your life. And then when I take the community chair and I set the community chair next to the other chair, Again, it changes the dynamic of our church. Do you realize that you're here today because of others? And you are where you are with God today because of others. You didn't get there by yourself. 
There were other people involved that have helped you along your walk and helped you along your way. Someone gave, someone prayed, someone witnessed, someone sacrificed, someone served so that you could be where you are with God today because of others. People all around us are looking for the same thing, and that's to be connected. Looking for relationships. See, we weren't designed by God to live a life that is insulated or isolated away from other people. And here's the concern, is that most churches in America have become a location or an institution. And that was never God's plan for the church. God never intended the church to be a location or an institution, but he always planned for it to be a body that's connected. See, oftentimes we go to the church like we go to a movie. We show up, we sit down, we enjoy the show, then we're gone. Or we go to, we go to church like we go to the mall. We just get in, get what we want, and get out or go look around a little bit. God never intended the church to be a, a building, an organization, or an institution, but he always meant for the church to be a body. And there's a huge difference between the two. We were created for relationships. God didn't want us to be spiritual hermits or lone wolves or even lone rangers. In fact, I've got a friend of mine that says even the lone ranger had Tano. Come on. He wasn't all that lone. John 13, 35, here's what Jesus said. Jesus said, by this, the way you interact with others, by this shall everyone know, shall all men know that you are my disciples, the way you love one another. It's evangelism. When we do community get together and we do church together, it is evangelism. It sends a message to the world that Jesus is alive because Christianity isn't just for believing, it's for belonging. Mark 1, 17, and Jesus said unto his disciples, said unto those that were listening to him, he said, follow me, come follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Jesus told a group of believers, if you follow me, I'll make you. You're not fishers of men yet, but follow me long enough and you'll start fishing. Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you something that you aren't, but you could be. Jesus said, follow me, I'll, I'll make you better. How many know Jesus makes life better? How many of you here today are a better husband, a better wife, a better parent, a better kid? Because of Jesus. And Jesus said, you may not be there yet, but if you follow me and you pursue me, I will make you better and I will make you a fisher of men. I'll get your mind off of yourself and I'll get you focused on others. And I'll change your life. See, Jesus... In game is not just to make you a better person, but to make your life about others. Jesus said, I'll make you fishers of men. Jesus said, I'll cause you to go to a deeper walk. So here's the thing followers are fishers. We are blessed in order to be a blessing. Saved people serve people. That's how the kingdom is built. That's how the church grows. Now, follow me on this. Jesus loves you. That's pretty simple, isn't it? Jesus died for you. Jesus is a personal Savior. In other words, he doesn't just love the whole wide world. He does, but it's much greater than that. He doesn't just love us as a group. He doesn't just love us as a bunch together, but he loves us as individuals. He knows us individually. Jesus loves you. And here's the thing. He's been investing in you, blessing you, healing you, helping you, feeding you, because somewhere down the road, he wanted you to help others. Somewhere down the road, he's expecting a return on that investment. That's when we begin to take an interest in the lives of others. So I want you to do something. You know, I always encourage you to take notes. In fact, we've redesigned the, the, the cards in the seat back. And so in front of you on the seat back, there's new bulletin information, new prayer cards. The very back card says notes on it. Pull that out, and you can write down wonderful, amazing words of wisdom that the world has never heard before. 
And you can write some notes. So vertically on that piece of paper, write the word others. We're going to break it down. You know I like doing this. It just helps us to remember. So I'm going to give it to you this morning. Okay, write the word others. And then next to the letter O, write the word opportunity. And here's the deal. Opportunities are everywhere because people are everywhere. When I look at others, I'm looking for an opportunity to speak in their life. When I'm looking at others and I'm thinking about others, I'm looking for an opportunity, whether it's on the job, in a park, in a restaurant, or somewhere else. I'm always looking for that opportunity to share Christ. Now, let me ask a question. Are there any fishermen in the house? Anybody? Let me, first of all, let me say thank you for being in church on Sunday morning. Amen. I know the option. But I will say any, any fish that you catch on Sunday are the devil's fish. <laughs> they need to be brought to my house, and I will take it from there and fix it all up for you. If you are a fisherman, here's what you know, that sometimes you have to wade out into their world in order to catch them. And that's what opportunities are. That's my opportunity to wade out into the world to where other people are, to go into their world, not just expect them to come to mine, but to take Jesus to others. That means I may need to learn something about them. I may need to genuinely be concerned about them and care about them. But I've got to find that opportunity. You've got to go where the fish are. So my work is where I become a doer of the word. My work is where I, I let the discipleship chair flow through me. My, my family is where I become a doer of the word. My neighborhood is where I begin to change the world around me. These are places that I tell his story. How many realize this? Even Jesus had to tell his own story. Jesus went about all the time saying, hey, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. No man comes to God except to me. Jesus had to tell his own story. We need to tell that story as well. Next to the letter T, write the words, these two words, take time. I've often said that so many times we wear around our neck an invisible I'm too busy sign. We are so important. We are so busy. We've got to go, go, go because the whole world depends on us. And if I don't do what I'm doing, then the world can't survive. We need to take that invisible Sign off and lay it down and take time for the people around us. Not only do we take time to speak to them, to notice them, to find the opportunity, but take time to get to know them, know their names, know their kids, know what their hurts are, know what their desires are. See, here it is. It's called invest, then invite. You don't just go beat people up with the Bible and demand that they come to church, but you begin to invest in them, love on them, care about them, and somewhere down the road, they're going to listen to what you have to say. The letter H, write this, help them see they need Jesus. Help them see they need Jesus. Because there are a lot of people, a whole lot of people that are looking for love in all the wrong places. They've got this incredible void on the inside of them that they're trying to fill through drugs and alcohol and sex and, and any, any other vice they can think of because they keep coming up short. And somehow we need to tell them, no matter how much you drink and party and do whatever you want to do, it's never going to meet that need. Only one person can meet that need, and that's Jesus. That's what you're looking for. you got to help them to see that what they're doing is not what they need. We were all there, right? We were all there, right? But it was Jesus that made the difference. E. Encourage them to church. See, even if you win them to the Lord in the, in, in, at work or in the neighborhood, you got to connect them to church because the Great Commission has never been win the lost. The Great Commission has always been win the lost and make disciples. And this is what we do. This is what we're good at. We make disciples. We grow people. We feed them with the word. We, we challenge them. We make them be better people. See, we do a lot of things in this church that are not just for you or for me. They're for the unbeliever, for the unchurched. It may be a big event. It may be music. It may be the lights, the atmosphere, the hospitality, things that we do for their kids or for the youth. 
And there are people that will say, well, you know what, Pastor, here's the deal. People should just come to church to come to church because it's the right thing to do. I couldn't agree more. You are 100% right, but they won't. So we have to do what we have to do. It's called evangelism. It's not me, church. The church exists to tell his story. It's not about what I want. It's about, God, how do I relate to my generation? How do I connect to the people that are in my neighborhood? How do I reach out and find the needs of what people are wanting? Or refuse fear. Don't be afraid of people. We all put up these walls. We all put up these paper walls and these paper tigers. And, and we need to not be afraid of people because we all have needs and hurts. And then lastly, next to the letter S, write the word share. Share his story. And one of the greatest ways to share his story is to share your story. There's something about a changed life. There's something about that you can go to someone and just say, yeah, I don't have all the answers to all of life's questions, but I can tell you what he did for me. I can tell you how he changed me. I can tell you this is what I was before, but this is who I am now. It's hard to argue with a changed life. It's hard to argue with something that's right before your eyes that you see someone that's happier than they've ever been, that they still have faults and shortcomings, but, man, they are working harder than they've ever worked, and they're finding Christ. Share your story. Not only what Christ has done for you, but tell him what he's doing for you. Man, he's doing this in my family. He's changing my family. He, he answered this prayer for me. He's done this for me. That's how we share his story. And then lastly, let me say this, is that we tell the story through giving. It cost to win the lost. Realize this, that we are stewards over everything that we have. It doesn't belong to us, it belongs to him. Psalms 24.1 says, the earth is the Lord's. Psalms 50.10, all the cattle on a thousand hills belong to God. Haggai 2.8, God owns all the silver and gold. Job 4.11, God owns everything under heaven. And I've shared those scriptures and countless more. And they all are painting a picture that says God owns it all. So I would just say on the heels of that, remember whose world you're living in, whose air you're breathing, and whose money you're spending. Because at the end of the day, it all belongs to God. Wayne Myers, my friend and mentor, said this, there's a gospel to preach, souls to save, hungry to feed, missions to support, services to hold, buildings to be built, and we are still asking, what's the least I can do? What's the least I'm required to do? How much do I have to do instead of saying, God, everything I can, I want to give for this message. Brother Myers goes on to say, if you have trouble giving, then go back to God and get a double dip of God's love. See, here's a powerful principle. If you want more, love more. Love's the key to everything. If you want more, love more. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, am, am I a river or a reservoir? And what a reservoir does is it takes water in and it holds it and it becomes stagnant. It becomes a breeding ground for all types of junk. But a river flows life wherever it goes. A river is always flowing, touching people and bringing life. And God has called us to be a river, not a reservoir. God has called us to let these things flow through our lives. See, the gospel is free for anyone to hear, but it's not cheap. It takes money to present it. Two fundamental truths of outreach. One is this, God will bless you to be a blessing. The whole reason he made Abraham rich, and Abraham was one of the richest men in the world. The whole reason he made Abraham rich, you know why? So that he could establish his covenant. That means so that he could, all these riches would point towards God. And Abraham would use his wealth and influence and riches to influence the world. And two, when we bless others, God will take care of our needs. And I've seen it over and over and over in my life and in the lives of countless other people 
that when we bless others, God takes care of us. Jesus said this, when you give up something in this life for others, I'll give back to you both in this life and in the life to come. Here's an incredible theological fact. We're not all going to be equal in heaven. Jesus said, when you give in this life for his cause, he said, I'll bless you in this life, but for eternity, I will bless you. It's powerful. See, the more we bless others, the more he blesses us. He said, to whom much is given, much is required. So anytime we hold finances in our hand or God does something for us, we have to think, how can I give it away? How can I live life with an open hand and not a closed fist? And ultimately, it comes down that I focus on others. And what can I do for them? And as I said, when you begin to bless other people, God always brings more into your life. I want to ask you to do something. Just bow your heads for just a moment. I want to pray. Father, this morning, we've come to this place that we just have to trust you and and say, what are you saying to us? And everything that I've said, all the things that I've shared, and there's no way we can remember everything, but God, I know there are some things that you can bring back that you want to pinpoint in our lives today. Your head's bowed, and let me ask you just two questions this morning. One is very simple. It says, How many of us are willing to say, God, help me to be mindful of others? Can I see your hand this morning? Isn't that a great way to live life, just thinking about others? Help me to worship with others in mind. Help me to hear the word of God with others in mind. Help me to to do life with others in mind. Not just myself, not just my needs, but others. That how many of us can say this morning as well, God, help me to re-examine my giving. See, my giving is my worship. My, my giving is my part of telling his story. I can't always go and I can't be a part in every ministry, but I know I can help tell the story. Every time I give an offering, I'm telling his story. And how many of us can say, God, help me to examine my finances, that I can trust you. Amen. I want to develop in this church a culture that sees others, that reaches out to others, that it just becomes a part of who we are, that the people around us aren't strangers, but they're people that Jesus died for. And I don't want to overwhelm you, and I certainly don't want to guilt you into doing it. I just want to encourage you, open your eyes. Recognize the opportunities that God brings. So I think the obvious next step is this, is that maybe some are here this morning and and you're just saying, I'm looking for something in my life and I'm coming up short and I'm coming up empty or, or I came this morning because I am hurting. I came this morning because I need something. I need answers. I need comfort. I need a challenge. Whatever it is. And it's our goal this morning to take Jesus right to you wherever you are whether it's been through worship, whether it's been through those around you or through a message. But you say this morning, I realize that I need Jesus in my life. What I want you to do is in just a moment, I want to pray. And if you've never prayed that prayer that says, Jesus, be the Lord of my life. I believe you're the son of God, that you died for me. I want to pray that prayer with you this morning. I'm not going to ask you to stand. I'm not going to ask you to come forward. The only thing I'm going to ask you to do in just a moment with heads bowed and eyes closed is that when I ask, will you raise your hand and let me know you're here that says, Pastor, pray for me. I'm looking for God in my life today. So if that's you this morning, right where you are, would you simply slip up your hand and say, Pastor, when you pray, pray for me. I want to give my life to Christ. I want to begin a journey today. Right now, raise it up. I'll see it. Thank you back there. Others, anyone else that would raise their hand and say, Pastor, pray for me over here. Thank you as well. God bless you. Anyone else that would say, Pastor, pray for me. Pray for me this morning. Thank you. God bless you back there. Over there. God bless you. I want everyone to look at me for just a moment. If you've been at Cornerstone any length of time, you love this because this is what we do. Those of you that raised your hand, I'm going to lead us in a prayer. 
All of us are going to say it with you because you're not alone anymore. We're in this together. But not only that, it reminds us where we came from. I wasn't always the perfect person I am today. And every time I pray this prayer, it reminds me how broken I was and how broken I am. How much I need him. And I love saying this prayer for you and I love saying it for me because it just simply reminds me it's not about me. It's about him. The Bible says that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you will be saved. It's a two-part prayer. You raised your hand. That's the first part of believing in your heart. And we're going to take that next step, which is saying with your mouth and praying that prayer. And the Bible says that after we pray this prayer, if you believe in your heart, God's going to make you a new creation. That means from the inside out. He's going to put his spirit into your spirit and make you a brand new creation. So I want us to say this prayer together, and I want you to hang an, emo- hang an emotion on it and mean it with everything that you have. Church, let's say this together. Dear God, today, I come to you just the way that I am. God, I am sorry that I've lived my life without you, that I've run from you, but today I run to you. Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. You died for my sin. You took my place, rose from the dead. Now you offer me eternity with you. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and be my Savior. Forgive me. Cleanse me. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's get some hands together. Amen. That's awesome. You know, the reason we celebrate is because we're mirroring heaven. The Bible says when someone gives their heart to Christ, all of heaven rejoices. Those of you that prayed that prayer, on the seat back in front of you, there's a gold celebration card. One side is prayer request. The other side is a celebration card. And I want to encourage you, if you prayed that prayer, write that information in. Drop it in the offering when it comes by. And you tell us how involved you want us to be in your life. When I get that information, I want to send you a letter and send you a book. And, uh, and then we just let you decide from there how much you want us to be involved. But we are here for you. So I want to tell you this morning, I love you. I believe in you. I've also asked our life room, our, our, our prayer warriors from the life room, when service is over this morning and we dismiss, they're going to be right over here under this screen here on this side, that if you've got a need or question or need prayer, They're going to be there to minister to you after service is over. And so they'll stay as long as you need them to, to just talk to you or share some scriptures with you or hear your story and what you're going through. These are great men and women from our church that want to pray with you. So please take advantage of that. Guys, we love you. God bless you this morning. Thanks for listening. Yes. Give a hand clap. God is good. Yes, he is. So as we prepare our tithes and offerings, Pastor talked about giving. Um, We're just going to continue to worship. That's what this is. We're worshiping God with our tithes and offerings. And one thing that Cornerstone does is they do, they give as well. And they partner with other ministries. And one of the, the ministries that we partner with is Feed the Children. And Feed the Children, most of us know who they are. They minister and give food and, and other supplies around the world and in our community. So um, I just want you to know that that is one of the areas where your offerings go um, when you do give. So if you would, just hold your tithes and offerings in your hand. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you. We thank you for this opportunity that we get to continue to worship you. God, you are so good. You have blessed us that we may be a blessing to others. And as Cornerstone takes Jesus to others, we are a part of that. Father, I just pray that you enlarge our territory, Lord, and bless those that give. In Jesus' name, amen.
What's going on, Cornerstone? We hope you had a great service with us today. If you did, please check in on Facebook and tell the whole world about it. With every check-in, you help support ministries around the world. If you're new to Cornerstone, text the word hello to 405-266-2242 so we can connect with you. There's lots of things happening here, so let us fill you in on what's going on. Bling ladies, we'd like to invite you to join us this Tuesday night at 7 p.m. in the Gathering Place. We've got lots of fun games lined up to play and some great desserts too. And as always, we'll have lots of great fellowship and a time of prayer. If you need childcare for your fifth graders and younger, please go to cornerstone.tv today and sign up. We'll have the pool to ourselves at Reno Swim and Slide next Sunday evening, June 11th from 7.30 to 9.30 p.m. Bring your family and a dessert and we'll enjoy a great evening of fellowship and swimming. Oh, hey guys, Man Up will be going to Top Golf in Oklahoma City on Thursday, June 22nd. We'll be leaving from Cornerstone Church at 5.15 and we'll be caravanning there. Cost is $15 per person, plus $5 if you're a first-time player. This will be a great evening of fun and fellowship. And don't forget, we also have a fun Man Up event planned at Catalyst this Tuesday night at 6.30. If you need more information on these events or any other events, check out the What's Happening card in the seat pack, visit the Connection Center, or online at cornerstone.tv. All right, so before we dismiss you guys, we'd like you to stand to your feet, 